tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Sex with a witness, hotel rooms, exotic dancers. The disturbing details about RCMP officers in the Surrey 6 murder investigation. A powerful vote, I guess you'd say. Voting day. Will the Nanaimo by-election tip the balance of power in the legislature? And... We think it's a handsaw, so probably a 24-inch handsaw. Who chopped down dozens of trees on the Langara golf course? This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We begin with breaking news from Surrey. A transit police officer has been shot near the Scott Road Skytrain station. The CBC's Tina Lovegreen joins us now live with the latest. Tina. That's right, Mike and Anita. A transit police officer has been shot, and we've been told that the officer has been taken to hospital. And according to the media relations officer with the force, they say that the officer is doing okay. Now, take a look at the scene. This is the scene right now in Surrey. What we know is that the shooter is still at large. Surrey RCMP say the suspect has not been located and may be armed, so they're asking people to avoid the area at all costs. Now, the shooting happened at 4 o'clock near Scott Road Skytrain Station, and I just got off the phone with a resident who can see the scene unfolding and from her balcony, and she says it started off with about eight police cars rushing to the scene, but now it's expanded to at least 30 cars. Police from both Surrey and New Westminster uh, Police Department are there covering a very large area spanning from the SkyTrain station to about six residential blocks from there. So they've secured a very large parameter as they search for the suspect. Now, the SkyTrain service at Scott Road station is closed completely. There is a bus bridge in place from Scott Road to Gateway Station and King George Boulevard northbound at 128th heading towards the Patello Bridge is closed, and there is, of course, a lot of congestion in that area. Again, this is all unfolding right now, but what we do know is that a transit police officer has been shot, the officer has been taken to hospital, and the suspect is still at large. We'll bring you the updates as soon as we find out more. Tina Lovegreen for us live. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> We are learning disturbing details tonight, 10 years after three RCMP officers were charged with misconduct in the Surrey 6 murder investigation. The nature of their offenses have always been a mystery, but we now know one of the disgraced officers had a sexual affair with a key witness and that his colleagues kept it all a secret. The CBC's Rihanna Schmunk was in court today and has more details. This is the first time in a decade we're learning the truth about what happened here. There's been rampant speculation for years, but finally one of the primary investigators, Derek Brassington, has described it himself. He said he treated the witness like she was his girlfriend. She was a potential key witness in the Surrey 6 investigation and Brassington was assigned to make sure she continued to cooperate. Instead, he started a romantic relationship with her in 2009. They spent nights drinking together and having sex in hotel rooms that were paid for by the RCMP. They went on three-hour boat cruises and acted like they were a couple in public. Brassington used his homicide investigator's business card to hire an exotic dancer one night that they were together. The details of the affair were revealed during Brassington's sentencing hearing earlier this month, but because of a publication ban, they couldn't be reported until today. Two of Brassington's fellow officers also pleaded guilty for failing to report Brassington's affair. Danny Michaud was sentenced to three months house arrest and David Atu got six months. Court heard that Atu also kissed a second witness during the investigation into the worst gangland killing in BC history. Six people were gunned down at a Surrey high rise in 2007. Prosecution continued and resulted in five convictions despite the officer's conduct here. But Mounties had all of their marriages disintegrate in result of this case. And Brassington was in tears as he apologized to the court and said he shouldn't have done this as a cop, he shouldn't have done this as a father, and he shouldn't have done this as a husband. And the mood was somber throughout the hearing. Rihanna Schmunk, CBC News, Vancouver. And tonight could be a by-election for the books, one that impacts the entire province of B.C. Nanaimo residents have just a few hours until polls close to decide on a new MLA. Reporters Jesse Johnston and Tanya Fletcher are live in Nanaimo right now with the Liberal 
and NDP camps. And we're going to start with our provincial affairs reporter, Tanya. Nanaimo has long been an NDP stronghold. No doubt they're banking on that support tonight. They certainly are, and Mike and Anita, you can feel it here in the room. We've got this room packed with uh, volunteers, and Premier John Horgan actually showed up just a few minutes ago to uh, pump up his candidate, Sheila Malcolmson, and you could really feel it in the room. He did seem confident. He joked. He picked up his coffee cup and said, I sure hope someone put something in here. So he did seem quite calm, quite relaxed, um, and that's despite the high stakes riding on this by-election. And we'll explain to you more about why this is such a big deal. Let's take a look at the current breakdown of the seat count within the legislature. So as we know... Um, the opposition Liberals currently hold 42 seats, that's just shy of the 43 currently held by the uh, NDP Green Alliance that they formed in uh, 2017 after the spring election. If the Liberals win this riding, that will bring that to a 43-43 count in the House, and that will uh, involve then independent uh, Speaker Daryl Plekis. He will be required to break any tie votes. That is what hinges on this election. And out at the polling stations this morning, we spoke with many voters heading in uh, to today about those grand implications. The big question is whether they're choosing to focus on local issues and the best candidate, or or whether they're voting strategically with perhaps the provincial landscape of uh, BC in mind. Here's what they had to say. I think people, voters here, understand the power that's in their ballots here today, given how this could affect the provincial government? I hope so. I hope they all, all think, you know, because we really need good government and strong government. It's kind of uh, a powerful vote, I guess you'd say. Vote splitting is a real thing these days, um, but at the end of the day, I just feel best voting with my conscience. It's been really interesting to see the ground game as well as this campaign has mobilized not just for the NDP but also the Greens and Liberals. By-elections don't tend to garner this much attention but because of the high stakes nature of this by-election we have seen the NDP machine out in full force. NDP as we mentioned Premier John Horgan has been here many times in the last few weeks and he's here again tonight. We'll see what that does for candidate Sheila Melkinson. She was out uh, chatting with people as well today and some high rec name, name recognition from her as well. She's a former MP and uh, has that uh, federal political experience now trying to move towards the provincial New Democrats and we'll see the weight of this by-election riding on her shoulders if she can pull out a win and keep the status, status quo in the legislature or perhaps send us to an early election. Mike, Anita? We shall see Tanya Fletcher live at NDP candidate Sheila Malcolmson's headquarters tonight in Nanaimo. Of course, tonight's vote could very well launch the Liberals back into the driver's seat. Let's loop in now with reporter Jesse Johnston. He's live at Liberal candidate Tony Harris's headquarters. Jesse, it certainly feels like this race could be close. Well, Anita, you heard Tanya mention uh, the NDP and what their ground game is like, especially here on Vancouver Island. The B.C. Liberals n know very well what they're up against, and that's why they're throwing the full weight of their party behind their candidate, Tony Harris, here. Uh, he was out at a campaign stop thanking volunteers uh, a little bit earlier on today, and at that event, it was like a who's who of senior members of the B.C. Liberal Party. Former cabinet ministers Mike Bernier and Michelle Stilwell were there. Uh, and then just walking back to my hotel today, I ran into uh, former transportation minister Todd Stone, who's in town from Kamloops, showing his support for the campaign. So we spoke with a political science professor a little bit earlier on today about how much uh, having all of this attention on Nanaimo, what impact that could have on voter turnout. And this is what she had to say. I think more, more people are going to show up than uh, in a regular uh, by-election because it's a crucial by-election. People are very conscious about this. And uh, also people are, want to uh, make sure that uh, uh, you know, Nanaimo is, uh, is not forgotten. You know, the, the wild card in all of this could be the Green Party. Uh, they're not taking this uh, lightly either. Uh, Andrew Weaver, party leader, has been out to this area several times during the campaign as well. Michelle Ney was out today uh, waving signs, talking to supporters, trying to uh, get the word out to get people out to vote. When I spoke with her, she said that when she started this campaign, she felt that she probably had about a one in five chance of winning. She feels a lot more confident about that today. In fact, all of the party leaders are, say they feel, uh, they're feeling pretty confident heading into tonight. And we'll find out in a short while just uh, whose gut feeling is on the money. Jesse Johnston live in Nanaimo tonight. Thanks, Jesse.
And we will be updating you with the latest from the polls throughout the evening online and on radio. Our election special will be live streaming on Facebook right after the polls close at 8 o'clock tonight. All right, 64 trees have been cut down by vandals at the Langara Golf Course in Vancouver. See how big this tree was? Just a shame. So somebody Some areas where trees were cut aren't in the vicinity of homes, deepening the mystery as to why anyone would chop them in half. Many of them are saplings and young trees. This is sheer vandalism. Yeah, and of course, you know, I mean, everybody pays for this. Every citizen of Vancouver had paid for the implant of planting of these trees and we'll have to we'll have to go through the process of replacing them and it's the unfortunate because everybody that enjoys this property and it's not just in the golf course there's trees on the perimeter side so everybody gets to take advantage of these trees that's the sad part the trees range from 10 feet to 40 feet high the park board is asking anyone who's seen suspicious activity at the golf course to contact police and a badly damaged crane is slowing down operations at the Port of Vancouver. A container ship crashed into it early Monday morning. Crews are now scrambling to repair the damage, and as John Hernandez reports, the accident could end up costing consumers. The container ship is still wedged beneath the collapsed crane, and officials are trying to figure out just how to remove it. The boat crashed into the crane early Monday morning at the Port of Vancouver. No one was injured, but the damage is significant. The 33-meter-high crane weighs well over 1,000 tons. Now two separate floating cranes, including one called the Beast, have been brought in to clean up the mess. That section of the terminal is entirely closed off, and now dozens of longshoremen are without work. Officials say the recovery will take at least a few days, but experts say the economic impact could last weeks. With the port not operating at full capacity, there could be delays getting goods both on and off the shore. To the Canadian economy, every day delay is hundreds of thousands of dollars. It puts them in a huge bind because they can't get the product on the shelves because it's sitting at the terminal. Port officials admit there will be a slowdown, but at this point it's unclear what the overall impact to the supply chain will be. However, if boats do need to be diverted to either Prince Rupert or Seattle, that will mean higher costs for consumers. The Transportation Safety Board is still investigating the cause of the crash. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. BC's gang unit is putting up a massive reward to try to capture one of the province's most wanted gangsters. $100,000 for anyone with information that leads to the arrest of 41-year-old Connor DeMonte. He's wanted for the murder of gang rival and Red Scorpion Kevin LeClaire, who was gunned down at a Langley strip mall back in 2009. The hit was part of an ongoing turf war between the United Nations and Red Scorpions. Since LeClaire's death, 18 UN gang members have been arrested, but DeMonte is still on the loose. The eyes of the, pub or the police are few, but the eyes of the public are many. We need those people who have information to tell us where Connor DeMonte is so we can return him to justice, return him to Canada, just as was done with Corey Valley. Fellow UN gang member Corey Valley was found guilty in 2018 of Leclerc's murder and for conspiring to kill the notorious Bacon Brothers. A Richmond trampoline park is denying responsibility for the death of a 46-year-old man at its facility last year. Victoria resident Jay Greenwood died after doing a flip into a foam pit at Extreme Air Park. His three stepchildren witnessed his death. His widow is suing the park, alleging the foam pit was not properly supervised and there wasn't enough foam to support people using it. In its response, Extreme Air Park argues Greenwood ignored warnings by staff and misused equipment in the moments before his death and that he was either too tired too drunk or too high to safely use the facility. None of the claims in the lawsuit or in the response have been proven in court. The BC Court of Appeal has dismissed an application from a man who was sentenced to three years in prison for a deadly houseboat crash. In 2010, Leon Reinbrecht crashed his speedboat, killing one man and injuring eight others. As Leon Young reports tonight, the victim's family members say they have waited too long for today's outcome. It's been nearly a decade since her brother was killed, but Lorraine Tumulty hasn't been able to find closure until today. We can finally set this at rest and 
hopefully, hopefully, you know, celebrate Ken's life now and not have to just worry about the courts and, and everything that comes up with that. The man who killed her brother is finally going to jail. This is the scene Tomalty says she's been reliving for the last eight and a half years. Her brother's houseboat torn to shreds after Leon Reinbrecht slammed his speedboat head on into it following a joyride fueled by drinking and marijuana on Chuswap Lake. He was traveling so fast, half of his vessel was buried inside Brown's slow-moving houseboat. Kenneth Brown was killed on impact. He had a lot of life left in him and for it to be gone so just like that, it was, it's difficult. Mounty said at the time it was miraculous that more people weren't killed. The lake was packed with boaters enjoying a night of Canada Day fireworks. Witnesses say they saw Reinbrecht doing donuts and zigzagging through the water before the crash. There were a total of 12 people on Brown's boat. Eight of them were injured. And Tumulty says her heart goes out to them. Together they have been dragged through the court system as Reinbrecht fought to appeal his criminal negligence convictions, denying his wrongdoing. Yeah, it's... It, that's the hardest part. He's never showed any remorse to us. He's never, you know, show, he's just never showed any remorse to the family or the people on the boat. Reinbrecht was seeking a judicial stay of proceedings, claiming his right to be tried within a reasonable time was infringed. A BC Court of Appeal judge dismissed his claim, sending him to prison to serve a three-year sentence. Hopefully he'll have some time to reflect on what he's done. Not just the accident, but the whole eight and a half years, what he's put the family through. Time now to focus on the happier memories. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. The SPCA is still looking for homes for several horses that were seized during an animal cruelty investigation last month. 27 horses were rescued from a property in Langley in December. The horses were allegedly neglected. They were found living in inadequate and unsanitary conditions with hazardous objects strewn about, and suffering from a lack of proper food and water, lice, infestation, overgrown hooves, and rain scald. 19 of the horses have already been adopted. Staff and volunteers have poured their heart and soul in caring for these animals, and especially over Christmas. Christmas Day, these horses were not left alone. They were well cared for. So to actually see them go to their forever home is really, really heartwarming. The remaining eight will be put up for adoption once they are well enough to be moved to a permanent home. It's cost the society more than $30,000 so far to care for and rehabilitate the horses. The investigation into the case is ongoing. Indigenous groups on both sides of the border are calling for a stop to new ships entering Delta Port at Tawasin. Members of the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation and Washington State's Lumi Nation want to cap the number of ships entering the Salish Sea while an impact study is completed. The Vancouver Port Authority wants to expand Delta Port so it can handle up to three container ships at one time. But the two Indigenous groups say fisheries and resident orca populations, as well as their traditional economies, will be threatened by an expansion. As a mother, I am so angry that this is even a project because of the danger that puts all our tribal fishermen in and it puts my own children in. The project is currently in the middle of an environmental review. Once built, it would create a new island just offshore to Wasson oh and provide 1,500 new jobs. Well, it was another relatively mild, almost uh, spring-like kind of day here in Vancouver. But that certainly was not the case for the rest of Canada. Take a look. Oh my God, it's cold, man. I didn't realize how cold it was until it's, it's cold, man. Just wanna lay in bed, cuddle up and stay warm. Cold warnings are in place for eight provinces and two territories. The bitter cold is a result of a split in the polar vortex, which has pushed temperatures into minus double digits. The coldest spot was Key Lake, Saskatchewan, where it hit minus 46 with the wind chill. It felt like minus 56. It's even worse, of course, in the U.S., where cities in the Midwest are virtually shut down. Even the U.S. Postal Service suspended delivery across six states. And <laughs> Rodana Wagstaff is here now. Uh, pretty crazy just to see our colleagues from across the country reporting. 
completely covered up. Some of their eyelashes frozen. It's, I know, yeah. just <laughs> nuts. And I also appreciate that you put that before our forecast because mm -hmm. really it's just British Columbia and Alberta not in this polar vortex uh, that has engulfed most of North America. But I am looking at the long, long range here and we could actually be getting into not a polar vortex, but some of our coldest air of the year yet as we head into next week. So we have by no means uh, past winter. We are still not done with the risk of, dare I say, some snow. And I'm gonna be talking a, a lot more about that later on in the show. But uh, yeah, just some wild uh, numbers across the rest of the country. Let's take a look at our numbers here in Metro Vancouver. We'll hope that nobody uh, across the east is watching tonight anyway. Five right now at YVR, five out towards Pitt Meadows. Uh, five's right across the board, basically. And we will stay milder tonight uh, than we have the past couple of nights because of this cloud cover that's moved in. That cloud cover is ahead of the next weather maker that will actually bring some uh, winter storm conditions to parts of the BC interior. Uh, Peace region looking to get close to 40 centimeters at higher elevations starting tomorrow night as that low pressure system moves in over the next 20 24 hours for us though uh, pretty steady as far as temperatures go there's a slight risk of a few showers overnight the bulk of the rain should hold off until tomorrow night i'll be back later to talk about that snow and stick around through the commercial break i'll be taking questions about the cold as well good stuff thanks joe you're welcome this weather update is brought to you by your local remax agent the experience the tools the know-how that's the sign of a remax agent and our show, of course, ends at about 7 o'clock. After that, at 8 o'clock, we will have a live show for the Nanaimo by-election online. You can get all the results as they're coming in. Yeah, polls are close closing in about, uh, about an hour and 40 minutes from now. Mm -hmm. So 8 o'clock for that. Uh, and, of course, you can find us on all platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Another emotional day in Saskatchewan today, a final day of stories of loss and pain. So what's next in the trier? trial? We'll tell you after the break. Thanks for those of you who have uh, stuck around on Facebook or YouTube Live, taking your questions about the deep freeze across the country. But I wanted to start off, we were uh, talking about this yesterday, about any questions you might have about the Kilauea volcano eruption on the Big Island. I was just there and I'm working on a story that I'm uh, looking forward to sharing with you soon. Uh, but I've already had some great questions. Uh, if you want to add to those, uh, I've got my producer here sending me questions live on my phone. Uh, but ones that uh, were sent in yesterday uh, include how many different types of volcanoes or are they all the same and what type of volcano was Kilauea? Kilauea was actually uh, a shield volcano. There are three main types of volcanoes, strato, shield and dome and uh, shield are the ones that uh, sort of take up the most amount of space and, and from above look like a giant shield made up of all these layers of volcanic events which ended up erupting last year. Uh, I was on the ground to see those changes and uh, it is pretty incredible. One more Kilauea question uh, to do with lightning. We did see some pictures of lightning last year. What causes that? The eruption of all these tiny particles both from fissures and the main vent uh, creates static electricity and it's the uh, lightning trying to connect those positive and negatively charged particles that end up uh, leading to what is known as a dirty volcano. That's when you get those uh, lightning strikes. So please feel free to ask me more questions. I'm looking forward to sharing that piece with you. We have to talk about the cold because the rest of the country is as we uh, gloat with our crocus pictures. Uh, Laura Miller asks, uh, could a polar vortex be as strong and as cold as uh, what's happening in the Pacific region? Great question. It is very rare for us here on the West Coast to get into the heart of that cold air. And you can see here the current wind chills across the country. Uh, normally, the Pacific Ocean moderates our temperatures enough so we don't see that true Arctic air. But as I look in the long, long range forecast, I do see our first true Arctic outflow set up for uh, next week. So as early as Sunday night into Monday, we could be looking at some snowfall and we could be looking at afternoon highs down around minus four, minus five for midweek next week. So again, not a true polar vortex. It's always modified because of our ocean air, but we haven't dodged winter yet. Uh, getting some questions, uh, 
Oh, yeah, another one about the polar vortex from Joe. Uh, looking forward to taking some pictures of the SkyTrain racing across the snow. Uh, it doesn't look like we will see anything like the rest of the country's getting because of our ocean temperatures. But I do see a reversal of this jet stream. So right now the jet stream running very high in the west. I've added the jet stream on here. That's why BC and Alberta and parts of the Yukon have been uh, so warm as of late. Of Vancouver, our temperatures have come in almost a full degree above seasonal for the month of January. But I see that uh, jet stream that's pulled down that polar vortex retreating and perhaps uh, reversing a little. So get ready for a deep freeze in uh, our neck of the woods as well as we head into uh, early next week. Uh, getting some questions about snow, and it does look like we may see some snow with this polar vortex as well. I will have more details later on the show, but for now... It was another emotional day for family and friends of victims of the Humboldt Broncos bus crash. They were taking part in the sentencing hearing for Jaskarat Sidhu, the truck driver who pleaded guilty to causing the crash. And as Karen Pauls reports, this was the final day for sharing their stories of loss. A bitterly cold day as friends and family arrived to give and hear still more emotional victim impact statements. Athletic therapist Dana Bronze died in hospital five days after the crash. Her parents haven't ordered a headstone yet because it makes her death too real. We have a beautiful church in our parish and, and uh, it's this kind of a dream, of course, to be able to walk her down the aisle in that beautiful church. Um, instead, we had to figure out how we were going to plan a funeral. Dana's dad is trying to forgive Jazz Karat Singh Sidhu because he knows Dana would want that. I don't think it's going to do any good for him to be in jail for a long time, but I guess the biggest hope is to change attitudes of other people. Um, you know, when you see people driving down the street with the phones in their hands yet it, and, and drive through stop signs, and you know, it, it's frustrating. Also today, the parents of Xavier LaBelle shared what it was like to believe their son had died at the crash site. They had already begun to plan his funeral, but days later they were told he had survived the crash. There had been a mix-up with goalie Parker Tobin. Xavier's father tearfully read from a poem written by his son, who spent 62 days in hospital. There is a pain that continues. Empty lockers, empty benches. My friends are gone. We were talking about the future. You'll never know that. My friends, forgive me that I have survived and that you are dead. The Crown and Defence will make their recommendations for sentencing tomorrow and then everyone will wait to hear what the judge decides. Families of the victims are now being told they'll likely have to return at a future date to hear the fate of Jaskarat Singh Sidhu. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Melfort. Another Canadian diplomat has mysteriously fallen ill while working in Cuba. As Salima Shivji reports, the federal government is once again cutting the number of diplomatic staff at its embassy in that country. This is the 14th confirmed case of a Canadian who's felt those symptoms that are linked to the Havana syndrome, what people are calling this mysterious illness affecting American and Canadian diplomats who were stationed in Cuba. 14 Canadian cases, five of whom were children, but in this latest case, it is an adult who started feeling the symptoms very recently, just in December, and reported them at the end of last month, and it has now been confirmed it is indeed the Havana syndrome that that person has been experiencing. Uh, so the last two cases that uh, have been confirmed from Canadians were in the last few months, whereas the bulk of the people who were affected by these symptoms, the dizziness, the nausea, the headaches, uh, the Canadians were felt in 2017. So there was a lull in between the reported cases, but now cases are being reported again. And that is what has prompted uh, the Canadian government to reduce its staff at the embassy in Havana. 16 people work there right now. That could be reduced to about half of that number. People will be either returned to Ottawa or stationed at other consulates or embassies nearby. Uh, meanwhile, the cause is still very much elusive. The RCMP is investigating on the ground in conjunction with Cuban National Police. Uh, the Canadian officials do say that Cuba has been very cooperative in this process. They are very satisfied with that level of support. And Canadian officials here did say today that Cuban officials are just as frustrated as they are 
since they're still looking for the cause of this Havana syndrome. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. The next Francophonie Games were supposed to be held in New Brunswick in 2021, but the province says it is no longer willing to host. Premier Blaine Higgs blames skyrocketing costs and a lack of support from Ottawa. This was not an easy decision. However, without the additional funding from the federal government, which has a significantly greater physical capacity than a small province like New Brunswick, the added cost of the Games were always going to be a very steep hill to climb. The initial cost of the Games was $17 million split between the province and the federal government, uh, but it ballooned to $130 million earlier this week. The organizing committee said it had reduced that by almost half, but Higgs says there was no guarantee costs wouldn't rise again. Canada's biggest stock exchange has done something new. The TSX held an old-fashioned draw today to decide who gets to use three very coveted letters. The letters P-O-T, or POT, were up for grabs as a ticker symbol. And with 60 cannabis companies on the exchange, it generated, well, a lot of buzz. So the TSX held a lottery for the letters. Interested companies had to apply by yesterday. The winner hasn't been revealed yet, and we may know the winner uh, for some time. Uh, the company that got it has 90 days to start using POT or pass it on. The pot ticker symbol only came up for grabs recently when Saskatchewan's Potash Corp changed its name and gave it up. This is a live look from Surrey tonight. A transit police officer was shot late this afternoon. A spokesperson says the officer will be okay. Police are actively investigating and the shooter remains at large and is said to be armed at this time. Police are encouraging people to avoid that entire area. We're going to hear from the scene later in the broadcast and you can also visit our website for the latest details. Coming up, we head back to Nanaimo where voters were lined up today to cast ballots in the provincial by-election. We'll have the latest from the Harbour City next.
And here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A transit police officer has been shot and taken to hospital. The suspect is still at large. Surrey RCMP are asking everyone to avoid the area near Scott Road SkyTrain Station. A sexual affair, hotel rooms, exotic dancers. Ten years after three Mounties were charged with misconduct in the Surrey 6 murder investigation, we are now hearing the disturbing details. One of the primary investigators, Derek Brassington, says he treated a key witness like a girlfriend. Details of the affair were never revealed because of a publication ban in court that has now been lifted. And we're going to take you back to Nanaimo now, where are, we are watching a very key by-election. Yes, voters have been out in droves today with an understanding they could shift the balance of power in our province. CBC Provincial Affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher joins us live once again. And Tanya, you spoke with uh, BC's top politician not too long ago. Anita, yes, and we are at ground zero of why this by-election is such a big deal right across B.C. And you can feel it in the room. There is a lot of tension, a lot of uh, nervous laughter, perhaps, and the Premier himself is here. Anyone just tuning in or perhaps just walking in might think this is the John Horgan re-election campaign because he has been working in the room. He's been chatting with volunteers. He's been really mobilizing this camp, mobilizing this base. And you can tell he's just trying to get the energy up. He himself is quite confident. I spoke with him just a few minutes ago, and I asked asked him if he, as the Premier, as head of the NDP, felt the pressure and the weight of this by-election on his shoulders. Here's what he had to say. I don't, I don't feel pressure. I feel uh, privileged. I really do. Uh, the people in this campaign office, I've, uh, many of them have been friends of mine for a long, long time. And when I travel around BC, I see new Democrats who have been working tirelessly for the opportunity to demonstrate to British Columbians that BC is filled with new Democrats. They just don't know it yet. And so I also asked him, you know, there seems to be a divide among people. Are they voting for local issues and who they think is the best candidate? Or are they voting strategically with the mind of potentially toppling this precarious minority government? He said, you know, we can't ignore those greater implications, but he hopes people are voting with their conscience and truly uh, honoring and exercising democracy. As for the candidate, Sheila Malcolmson, she's been working the room as well. She came in a few minutes ago and spoke with John Horgan himself. And uh, she seems quite confident as well, perhaps a little bit nervous. And as we know, every I think the Premier just walked behind us there. Uh, they're all heading over to the Convention Centre now, and that's where we'll be headed as well. But yes, uh, for voters, voters themselves, we do know the stakes are high in this by-election, and they're well aware of the implications. Advanced voter turnout was extremely high. There are 45,000 registered voters in this riding, and more than uh, 9,000 of them, that's over 20%, already cast a ballot in advance. The political scientists say that's an indication of just how uh, high uh, the interest is in this by-election, not only from those in this riding, but right across the province. We'll keep you tuned throughout the evening as the results come in. Mike, Anita? All right, Tanya Fletcher live at NDP candidate Sheila Malcolmson's headquarters. Okay? Thank you. And we're going to be updating you with the latest from the polls throughout the evening on web and on radio. Our election special will be live streaming on Facebook with Dan Burrett after the polls close at 8 p.m. And at 6.38, a live look at downtown Vancouver tonight. Well, a day of changing weather today. The clouds moving in, rain on the way. How long? How much? Johanna will tell you next.
world's been incredibly pleasant in Vancouver these days. The birds are chirping, the flowers blooming, and it's still not even close to spring. No, but uh, old man winter is rearing his ugly head in the rest of Canada, especially in Manitoba, where the temperature dropped to minus 35 in some parts of that province today. And as the CBC's Cameron McIntosh reports, the conditions are becoming extremely dangerous. Hello. Are you guys home right now? In a Winnipeg wind chill that feels like minus 50, outreach worker Taggart Porter is looking for anyone living outside. I just want to see if you need anything, all right? Turns out there's no one here, but around the corner in a downtown alley. Hey, you got a second? Nikki and her friend Lee are living on the street. They aren't dressed for it. Just, you don't have a whole lot on there. Do you want a coat? We got some extra coats. Yeah, yeah come on, we'll get you one. They say they don't feel safe in shelters, so a couple minutes later, they're both given special jackets that double as sleeping bags. Uh, it means like a whole lot to me because um, this jacket, uh, I feel the cold air coming up in my stomach. So you're yeah. sleeping outside? Sleeping outside. How's that been? Uh, it's been hard. It's been hard, like really hard. Like uh, sometimes it's, you don't get enough rest because you don't feel safe. There's similar stories in other cities. In the United States, this cold snap is being blamed for at least six deaths and other problems in some cities that weren't prepared or equipped. Minneapolis is no stranger to winter, but wind chills here are also extreme. Police are handing out warm clothes. Hey, you need gloves! In Chicago, cold temperatures neared record lows, causing its normally ice-free river to freeze. We have coffee and cocoa. Of course, dangerous is relative. In Indianapolis, minus 17 is enough to issue public warnings. Please take precaution. Are you sure you don't want me to grab a bag? No. Okay. Back in Winnipeg, the Salvation Army is going out nightly to bring people into shelters. We want to make sure that we're available, we're showing people support, and trying not to let anybody fall through the cracks. Up on the roof of this building here. Porter is literally looking in the cracks, anywhere someone might be sleeping. Yeah, we'll just keep coming by and, until we connect. And hopefully get more people out of the cold. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Wow, just, I mean, it just looks cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when they say um, with the wind chill, it feels like minus 56, yes. like we're supposed to know what that feels <laughs> yeah. like. It's, know, like yeah. it's like, what? We know nothing of the sort. <laughs> no. No, I've never, I've never experienced minus 56. That's... That is incredibly cold. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have those kinds of temperatures in our forecast, but this is the first time I'm really going to say it. We do have the possibility of some snow in our forecast yeah we have not dodged the winter bullet yet uh not in our short range forecast let me take you to a live look of uh, downtown vancouver where it's a cloudy but milder evening uh, relatively dry i've just got the slight risk for a few spits and spots overnight but the bulk of the rain should hang off until tomorrow afternoon but i will talk more about uh, in just a few moments the impending snow that is possible in our long, long range. Uh, first of all, wind chills tonight, getting back to what uh, we all know minus 44 wind chill feels like. Uh, no, that is reserved for uh, central Canada and the U.S. Midwest tonight, the heart of that polar vortex, which is really just the swirling air around the Arctic that sometimes meanders south. The last time we really saw this entrenched in North America, though, was 2014. So this is an anomalous event and uh, a dangerous one at that. We are on the other side of the jet stream in through BC and Alberta uh, and in fact out towards parts of Atlantic Canada also on the other side of the jet stream but we are going to see the Arctic air mass uh, shift northward through early next week just as we start to get a bit of an Arctic outflow out on our west coast. We never really get into a true Arctic air mass because of the Pacific Ocean, but when we get an Arctic outflow set up, that's when we see the coldest of our air, and I am seeing indications of that for the end of the weekend into early next week. Okay, first we have to get through this low pressure system uh, that is bringing some winter weather to central and eastern BC. Out towards the Peace region, we've got winter storm watches in place for up to 40 centimeters uh, for Highway 97, really starting to ramp up uh, this time tomorrow. We will just see rain though for this event anyway across the south coast taking you through the overnight. We'll continue to see those mid to high clouds stream in from the west. Tomorrow morning though not out of the question that we could actually uh, start the day off with a few sunny breaks 
By noon hour, though, overcast, and by sort of mid-late afternoon hours, filling in. I think for the commute home, everyone will be uh, looking at the steady rain that will continue through most of uh, your Friday and even into the weekend. Temperatures, though, fairly steady, uh, dropping only down to a three or four tonight because of that cloud cover, keeping the heat in, and then back up to an eight, so just above our seasonal mark. Okay, big picture, watch the uh, warm front of this system. That's what's pushing into the interior. Prince George looking at 10 centimeters tonight, same story through the Caribou region. This is what's bringing the winter storm conditions to the north. We get the uh, backside of this that just brings the rain tomorrow afternoon and Friday with lingering showers through the weekend. Okay, let's take a look at that long range. Uh, temperatures staying relatively seasonal until Sunday. And then look at that dramatic cool down as we start to get into what models are starting to indicate is this Arctic outflow. So by Sunday night, if we do have those lingering showers coming in from the west, that may show up as snow. I don't see a big event on Sunday, but notice Wednesday also uh, indicating some of the uh, white stuff. We have not dodged the winter bullet yet, and I will keep you posted, I promise, but it's not out of the question. I'm not going to... Drinks anything. I see that smile. I see that <laughs> frown. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. Well, U.S. President Donald Trump was on the offensive today, attacking his own intelligence officials. Not everyone is happy with the critique, including his own party. More from Washington next. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Ring in the year of the pig with your favorite CBC Vancouver personalities, including me, at the Chinese New Year Parade on Sunday, February 10th. And CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of Megaphone Speakers Bureau, a series of free events addressing the overdose crisis and stigma surrounding addiction. Learn more at megaphonemagazine.com. And for more, check us out at cbc.ca slash bc.
as President Donald Trump lashed out at intelligence officials today after they put forward foreign policy opinions that differ from his own. And as the CBC's Lindsay Duncombe reports, the U.S. president is also at odds with his own party on these matters. Donald Trump spent his morning tweeting in defense of his foreign policy. The president tweeted that the situation in North Korea is the best that it's ever been and that the fight against ISIS is a tremendous success. Then he lashed out against the heads of intelligence agencies here in the United States. Here's what he said. He said, the intelligence people seem to be extremely passive and naive when it comes to the dangers of Iran, going on to say, perhaps Perhaps intelligence should go back to school. So why is this happening? It's because of what happened yesterday. The head of the CIA, the head of the FBI, the director of national intelligence all delivered the threat assessment to Congress. And what they said about the situation at various places around the world was in direct contradiction to what the president has said on many occasions. Here's the director of national intelligence, Dan Coats. Remaining pockets of ISIS and opposition fighters will continue, we agree, uh, we assess, to stoke violence. We currently assess that North Korea will seek to retain its WMD capabilities and is unlikely to completely give up its nuclear weapons and production capabilities because its leaders ultimately view nuclear weapons as critical to regime survival. It's not just the intelligence chiefs that Donald Trump is at odds with when it comes to foreign policy. The top Republican in the Senate, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, also spoke out against Donald Trump's decision to pull troops out of Syria, saying that the United States may not be the world's policeman, but it is still the leader of the free world. So this rift between Donald Trump and the leadership in the Republican Party is something that is rarely so public. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Trade talks between the U.S. and China are underway and expected to last two days in an attempt at ending a trade war between the two countries. The two sides are under pressure to reach an agreement before March 1st when another round of tariffs kicks in. Tariffs have already been slapped on $360 billion worth of goods spent, sent between the countries. A six-month-long trade war has shaken financial markets and clouded the global economic forecast. And the arrest of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou has complicated matters even further. U.S. officials accuse her of violating American sanctions on Iran. The arrest infuriated the Chinese government, which has since detained two Canadians. And we want to take you back to Scott Road Station in Surrey now where a transit police officer has been shot. It happened earlier today. The officer has been taken to hospital and is expected to be okay. Our Mira Baines is on the scene there tonight live. Mira, what are you seeing right now? Well, right now we're seeing dozens of police cars and we see a lot of police surrounding the SkyTrain station. Now they've secured the scene with yellow police tape. They're telling people to stay away from the area. There is a manhunt underway for the suspect who is believed to be armed. And now they're saying people should stay away from the area. And they're saying that Surrey RCMP is leading the investigation and will be providing details later. Now it happened at around 4 o'clock p.m. It happened at the SkyTrain station where this police officer was shot. Now, police are investigating. They still haven't identified either the officer, who the person was, and exactly what led to the shooting. And right now, police are telling people just to stay away from the area. Mike? All right, Mira, thanks very much. Live in Surrey tonight. Well, it was a unique moment in musical history and also an ending of sorts. 50 years later, we look back at a legendary show by the Beatles that ended up being their last. That's after the break.
was an iconic moment in music history. Exactly 50 years ago today, the Beatles gave a surprise concert on the roof of their London headquarters, singing together for what would be the very last time. And people from across the globe gathered in that spot today to mark the special anniversary. The CBC's Kayla Hounsel was there. This is a pretty special day for die-hard Beatles fans. People came from all over the world to gather here on Savile Row today to mark the 50th anniversary of the Beatles rooftop concert here on this roof on January 30th, 1969. It was the Beatles' last public performance and the story about how it came to be is an interesting one. The Beatles were producing a documentary about the recording of the Let It Be album and they needed a climax for the film so they decided there should be a public performance in a bit of an unorthodox location but the decision to hold it on the roof of Apple headquarters was a bit of a last-minute one there's many different ideas where they're gonna do it one idea was a Roman amphitheater in the middle of the desert in Tunisia in fact I actually sent some people over to Tunisia to check it out but it didn't work out and uh, one was an idea was gonna be on a luxury cruise ship around the world <laughs> Richard Porter has been doing professional tours of Beatles landmarks for more than two decades, but today's tour is special even for him. He told the crowd stories from that day, how the police showed up because there was so much noise and activity, and how they had to send someone to buy stockings for the microphones because it was just so windy up on the roof. But today was emotional for some people here too, to be among the crowd, listening to the music, imagining what it would have been like on that day and marking the end of an era. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, London. Big day for a lot of people, yeah. big fans. Yes, big day. And you are one of the big fans, I know. I'm one of the biggest <laughs> <Yes>. fans. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a stay-at-home dad in Alberta is making quite a splash in a different way on social media. After being laid off as a geologist, Calgary's David Bach decided to become a full-time caregiver and a part-time Instagrammer. Why not? With a little help from Photoshop and a whole lot of creativity, he posts silly comments on life <laughs> as a stay-at-home <laughs> dad. He also creates incredible make-believe worlds for him and his young son, Benjamin. Yes, Bach now has uh, almost 14,000 followers. Pretty good. At least one big company, Lego, wow, has actually ooh. hired him to create an ad, and the party <laughs> is about to get a bit bigger. Bach's second uh, child arrives in March. Pretty cool dad. Oh, might have to be uh, one of his followers. <laughs> <laughs> you can find our news program online. Dan Burritt's here at 11, and we're live streaming at 9. 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. <laughs>